In his second epistle to the Thessalonians, Paul the Apostle, concerning their misunderstanding as to when the day of the Lord would come, he writes this to them in the second chapter, in verse 3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. Well, as you expect, it's not the coming of the Lord that we're going to talk about this evening, but rather the falling away, the apostasy, as we call it in the Greek, the departure from Christianity that came very early on and lasted to this day. Now you notice that it's a particular movement that Paul has in mind because he says the falling away. Not that there would just be falling away, but that there would be the falling away. This is a significant thing to Paul. He writes about it very often in his epistles and mentions it in the book of Acts. And we're going to talk about it here and briefly take a look at history and what history has to say. And of course the uh, speakers that have went before me throughout the meeting have made my job easy because they've talked about the establishment of the church and the pattern, the divine pattern of it in the first century as it is found in the scriptures. And Paul makes some pretty strong features, talks about some pretty strong features here in this second epistle to the Thessalonians. We won't look in depth in this one single passage but it's enough to say that Paul thought it was a pretty serious issue. To Timothy, in his epistle, in chapter 4, Paul says that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. Now notice he says, the faith. Not the faiths, not denominationalism, not the a variety of churches that differ from one another, but the faith. You see, in the New Testament, as we have heard, correctly so, there was one faith in the New Testament age delivered once to the saints. It says that in Jude, one church, Ephesians chapter 4, Colossians chapter 1, one religion that was established by Christ and His apostles. Now, we get a problem in our day and age, and a problem that's been around since the first century, and that is... That people, the world, looks at whatever is called Christianity and they say there is Christianity. When it is often the case, and most of the time is the case, it's not Christianity. It is a departure from the divine pattern. Paul says something else about this in the 20th chapter of Acts when he calls the Ephesian elders to himself, his last visit with the leadership of that church, and he says, even amongst yourselves, that's the leadership of the church, will men arise and speak perverse things, drawing away disciples after themselves. So there, and also in his letter to Timothy, we see one thing. How is the mean, what is the means that the apostasy comes about? What causes the apostasy? It is false teaching. And it's as simple to cut as that. He says in uh, Timothy, he goes on to say when he mentions that some shall depart from the faith, he says, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of devils. He's talking about false teaching. And we got this mentality in the religious world today that says, doctrine doesn't matter. Don't preach doctrine, just preach Jesus. The fact of the matter is, doctrine matters. When Paul the Apostle spoke to the Ephesian elders there in Acts chapter 20 and told them that men would arise speaking perverse things, drawing away disciples after themselves, he says that for the uh, space of three years, night and day, he warned them about this with tears. Now that's pretty significant. If Paul the Apostle is going to shed tears, if the man is going to weep over these kinds of things, that makes it significant. And it makes it significant, uh, significant for us to talk about and name names. I'm not talking, of course, about names of individuals. I'm talking about the names of apostate religions. You know, we're going to take a look at history in our brief time here. Now, why do we look at history? Let's, let's be clear on that. Sometimes you refer to a writer, maybe a, a, what, what they call a church father, a patristic writer, in and, and the Middle Ages or early on. And we say, here's what, they, here's what they believe. And some people think, well, just because he believed it doesn't make it true. Of course, that's, that's a true statement. Sometimes the church fathers, as they are called, will have a truth and an error, sometimes in the same sentence. Sometimes they upheld truth. Sometimes they took a nosedive. 
But why do we look at history? Well, we establish what truth is by looking at the scriptures. And we know what truth is. That's what determines truth, what God's words says it is. And so you put the Bible on your mental map of history. You draw a straight line up into the modern age because truth doesn't change. And then you take a look at Christianity as it is found in history on throughout the ages. And you see how it navigated along the truth. Did it stray away from the line? In many cases it did. Did it kind of hover around the, the straight line? Sometimes it did. But not so often. That's why you look at history. And history is important as was said yesterday. Well, <clears throat> we're going to mention a few doctrines in brief. We can't go through all of them, of course. That would take quite a while. That have changed and have been added. we we'll take a look at a few here. Uh, first of all, here's one of the first significant changes that you can find in early history. And it was a change with baptism. In the New Testament, baptism, by definition of the Greek word, means to immerse, to plunge, to dip. The symbolism involved in it, in Romans chapter 6, is a burial and a resurrection. So, by the nature of the ordinance and by the definition of the word, it cannot mean pouring, right? That's pretty simple. And you don't find pouring, of course, in the New Testament. Well, very early on in history, you find references to pouring. There's a document called the Didache. Uh, most scholars date it in the mid-2nd century. Some scholars date it late 1st century. Whatever the case is, it's early on. The Didache makes reference to pouring. It makes reference to pouring three times on the head in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So there's an early reference to pouring, so they didn't take long. But here's the thing, and, and this is important. When it is found in the Didache, it is in context mentioned as a last resort. A last resort. That means that the established way of doing things is immersion. Of course, we see that in the Bible. And then early history, we see that immersion surely was the established practice, though there was some changes. But pouring was never authorized by the scriptures, never authorized by the apostles. Uh, Cyprian, a bishop of Carthage in the 3rd century, the 200s, he makes a defense in his letters for pouring. But it's a defense for the sick. And he says, quote, when necessity compels, emergency situation only. That's in the, th that's in the uh, 200s. And Novation, the same time frame, was the first historical person we know of to be poured upon. He was on a sickbed. That shows that pouring was an exception to the rule. Don't ever authorize. But it's interesting because Catholicism nowadays, and have been for some time, pouring is the primary way they baptize. Contrary to the meaning of the word. But pouring primarily is how they do it. So you see a development. You see in the first century there's no pouring. And then early on you see pouring in exception, in exceptions, emergency cases. And then you see pouring as the normal course of things. You see a development. So we move on. You know, uh, musical instruments. You just read the historians. You read the historians and all I'll tell you the same thing. That instruments were not used in Christianity by the early Christians. They will tell you that anywhere from the 600s to the 800s, organs made their first use in Christianity. And nowadays, of course, musical instruments as part of worship is just as common as prayer, but never authorized by the scriptures. You know, we could list many things. First of all, how about ecumenical councils? Starting with Council of Nicaea primarily and moving forward, these councils where all these bishops from different regions would come together and try to finalize and legislate controversial issues. Of course, then you would have later councils come back and try to reform their work, and then you would have another council come along and then try to reform the work of that council. But councils never were authorized by God in the Scriptures. And they never solved the problems. You had much pagan influence on Christianity in the early history. Uh, holidays like Christmas and Easter were originally never Christian and then brought into Christianity. As a matter of fact, uh, the Council of Nicaea fixed the date of Easter. But uh, these became eventually known, and especially in modern times, as quite Christian, just as Christian as anything else. 
uh, and commonplace. But they were never originally Christian. Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing the pagan influences on Christianity. You know, praying with beads was borrowed from paganism. Uh, you know, as a matter of fact, many years ago, I was in a bookstore, <clears throat> and I saw there a book that was written by a Catholic priest. It was called Catholicism for Dummies. And I thought, well, if they're going to write it for me, I might as well read it. So I started reading it, and the bishop, or whatever he was, maybe he'd been a priest, who wrote it, he says that to make it easier to make pagan converts, their pagan customs and traditions were tolerated. I mean, so they admit that. They make no bones about it. And that's the way it is, praying with beads. Musical instruments were in paganism before Christianity. And as a matter of fact, the early Christians criticized it for that, one of those reasons. Well, we could talk about the many doctrines that came throughout history. We could talk about the Assumption of Mary. We could talk about uh, penance. We could talk about praying to saints, praying to Mary, praying to angels. I want to focus, I want to focus on one of the stronger features of the apostasy, and that is the papacy. Uh, now let me note this. Christianity, as it is looked upon today, as I said, is a multiplicity of faiths and denominations. But here's the fact. Catholicism predates all of it. Yet Catholicism, as we are talking about, doesn't go all the way back to the first century. So it doesn't pre predate, as it claims, the Church of Christ as founded by Christ. But it does pre uh, predate denominationalism. Many of these practices were in Catholicism before they were in denominationalism. And the movement in the Reformation age of people out of Catholicism, they, they corrected many things, but then they took a lot of these apostate doctrines with them and kept them to the state. And so, understanding that, the papacy is a very important thing that I want to mention in context of the little historical remark. First of all, it should be known that the papacy, the papacy as we will note, really began to be established, if you will, in the late 400s. And from there on out, uh, really became concrete. But the fact of the matter is, it wasn't before then, as we will see. But the reason the papacy was so important is because after the fall of Rome, and some history, after the fall of Rome in the 400s, uh, Western Europe was really in chaos because there was no one single large empire or kingdom that could stabilize Western Europe. And so Catholicism really emerged as that one hope and could provide some means of stability because it was kind of everywhere, especially because by that time, the papacy really was taking effect and form. And so not only through the ages, therefore, did it gain spiritual dominance, it gained secular dominance. And when rulers, secular empire uh, emperors did rise up, now they never had a large dominion, usually just regional, they were still in allegiance with the Pope. That gave the papacy secular dominion. And it lasted, and they persecuted and oppressed through taxes and many other ways those that would not adhere to their doctrines. They killed those that would not adhere to their, their doctrines. They killed those that tried to translate the scriptures until the, about after the Renaissance age. So through history we could see, and the fact that Catholicism nowadays is still the largest group that claims to be Christian, and is often uh, cited to be Christian, you know, when the president cites the Crusades, and that's Catholicism, but he calls that Christianity. So they are still looked at by much of the world as Christian, by the Muslims. So it's important. This is one of the bigger apostasies. Well, first of all, as our brother rightly told us yesterday, in the New Testament, there was a plurality of elders in the churches. Clear, clear and cut. Uh, but we could establish that also from early history. You know, the uh, first, first Clement to the Corinthians, which is dated about 95 AD, that's first century. He mentions bishops being appointed by the church. He's claimed to be a pope, by the way, by uh, Catholicism, but he never mentions himself as pope. He never writes in the first person. He says, we, writing from Rome, we and us. Shepherd of Hermas, that is a, uh, that's a writing from the second century. And it mentions that the visions would be told with the presbyters, plural, in the church. The Didache, I mentioned that earlier, 
It mentions bishops and deacons, just like it was in the first century. As a matter of fact, you know, that's why some scholars, though they be in the minority, date it to the first century, because they see that that was the early practice of the church, to have bishops, plural, and deacons. And so they say, well, it must be first century. I'm not saying they're right, I'm just saying that's what some of them say. So the Didache testifies in the early history of the same pattern that you find in the Bible, a plurality of elders. Cyprian, I want to talk about Cyprian. Now Cyprian, the bishop of Carthage, is often touted by many as evidence of a papacy because they say, well, you see, he believed Peter was the rock on which the church was built. Well, you know what? He did believe that. He was wrong, but he did believe that Peter was the rock, and he was very early on. He was, again, I say, uh, third century. But here's the thing to remember. When they say that, what they don't tell you in many cases is from the context of his writings, he believes all the bishops succeeded Peter. He believes, uh, you should, I got the citations. I got the citations from these writings. In his 26th letter, he says, that through the changes of times and successions, the ordering of bishops and the plan of the church flow onward so that the church is founded upon the bishops and every act of the church is controlled by these same rulers. This is right after he mentions Matthew 16, 18 and what he said to Peter, what Christ said to Peter. So he believed that though Peter was the rock, that translated to all the bishops and he never rules out one single bishop. He's no evidence for the papacy. In fact, he's just the opposite. Uh, bishop Stephen from Rome, uh, well, let me set the background. Uh, there was a bishop named Basilides in the North African churches, and he was rejected from his office of bishop because of some sin. And so he went to the bishop of Rome, Bishop Stephen, and Bishop Stephen wanted him, as these are their titles, wanted him reinstated. Well, Cyprian wrote a letter rejecting Stephen, uh, excuse me, Stephen's uh, decision. And he says... That an ordination rightly perfected cannot be rescinded. The translation of that is, he can't undo what's been done. Stephen over there in Rome has been placed at a distance. Those are his words. He can't undo what's been done. Doesn't sound like Cyprian recognized any papacy to me. Vermilion was a writer who wrote to Cyprian. And I want to read what he says. He agreed with Cyprian's rejection of Stephen's decision. Vermilion says this. And again, I got the citations. They who are at Rome do not observe those things in all cases which are handed down from the beginning and vainly pretend the authority of the apostles. You uh, see some significant things there. First of all, you notice that Vermilion doesn't single out any one person. He says that they which be at Rome not that there's one guy at Rome claiming this, that they. So that shows, first of all, that all of those at Rome were claiming to be something special. Because it is Rome, after all. It's the uh, imperial city. Secondly, he says that they vainly pretend the authority of the apostles. He surely didn't recognize that they had any special authority. But you know, he doesn't say they vainly pretend, or rather, he doesn't say he at Rome doesn't vainly pretend the authority of Peter. Clearly, no papacy. <clears throat> Let me talk for just a minute on Ignatius. Quite an interesting fellow. You know, Ignatius, he was in the late first century and he died in 107 AD. Ignatius, a bishop of Antioch, he was quite an anomaly. He was quite out of the ordinary. You see, Ignatius did believe that there should be one chief bishop in the churches. And he was very emphatic about one chief bishop in the churches and that there should be an allegiance to the one chief bishop in the churches. And so, the scholars, some scholars, as a matter of fact, say that those are interpolations because he's so out of the ordinary for his time. I'm not saying that they're right, but... Nevertheless, let's deal with his writings. First of all, he did believe it. He believed there should be one chief bishop. So, but that's not authorized by the scriptures, number one. That was not the practice of the New Testament church, and the overwhelming evidence of those in his time frame did not agree with them. But secondly, he doesn't mention one bishop of bishops, 
He doesn't want, mention one super bishop over there in Rome. He never mentions that. As a matter of fact, here's some interesting notes. Now, we have several letters by Ignatius that he wrote to uh, a variety of churches. In every one of these letters, every one of them, he mentions their bishop, singular, and then talks about allegiance to that bishop every one of his letters except for one. Now, which letter, pray tell, do you think it is? Which is the one letter that doesn't mention their bishop nor allegiance to the bishop? If you had to take a wild guess in the dark, which one would it be? It would be his letter to those at Rome. I find that pretty significant. That the one letter that doesn't mention their bishop and that we should all follow the bishop is the letter to the Romans. Now you would think that a man thus minded who favored the idea of one chief bishop over others and who thought that that allegiance to the bishop was essential for unity, you think he would have said something in his letter to the Romans where you had the bishop of bishops and the vicar of Christ, you think he would have referenced that? You think he would have said something? Nothing. Now that's some loud silence from Ignatius. Ignatius is no evidence for the papacy. Though, now this is key, he is evidence that there began to be a progression. Even though in his time frame he was vastly minority in this thought. Contrary to the idea of a plurality of elders. But he's there. And we see others afterwards begin to escalate the bishops. We see that in history. But of course, uh, by the way, remember I mentioned the ecumenical councils? You know, uh, 325 AD, the Constantine called together, and then you got the Council of Ephesus, and then you got the one of uh, Chalcedon, and then you got another one of Nicaea, on and on. But they, those councils, if you study them, they don't look to the Pope for authority. These councils are trying to determine themselves. Constantine, the Emperor of Rome, was more of, a, of, a, of an authority figure above anybody else in the first council in, this, in Nicaea. They don't show any evidence of a recognized authority in Rome that has jurisdiction over all Christianity. That's not there. Now, as I said, we see an escalation. Now, by the time I mentioned Leo I, he started claiming succession to Peter and he started claiming jurisdiction over the other uh, churches and bishops. He's considered by many the first pope. And then it kind of weakened in history a little bit after him. And then, and then you had some strong popes again, or bishops like Gregory. And then from there on out, you basically got the papacy established. And then you've got the oppression by Catholicism on to the later ages. But that's what it was. You know, Catholicism didn't go back to the first century. It was a development. All the many doctrines that they hold, the infant baptism doctrine that came very early on and became a part of their of their religion. Magical baptism, as I call it. You know, the early Christians recognized that early Christians in history, outside of the Bible, they recognized the, uh, the necessity of baptism. But because of the doctrine of original sin that came into place, baptism started taking almost a magical essence about it. And then they believed, like Origen and uh, others, they believed that baptism for a baby would wash away the sins that he was born with. And so baptism was given its own power, and that continues on. You know, Catholicism has holy water, and they bless the water, and they can sprinkle it on you. You know, that's where we get the idea, believe it or not, of sprinkling holy water on, bapt uh, on vampires. And they start to burn and smoke because holy water's got something special about it. That all comes from that idea. But in the New Testament, baptism, though ne uh, ne necessary, was just an act of faith that once observed by a believer who's repenting and confessing Jesus, he was baptized and then God placed him into the church and then God forgave him. No power in the water. But that continued on into Catholicism. So, with the uh, assumption of Mary that I mentioned and the praying to statues and the uh, Hail Marys and the repetitions in their prayer, Catholicism did not just emerge on the scene of history one Tuesday evening. It didn't just pop into history. It was a developed religion. 
that developed through the centuries over a slow process, one increment by increment, one baby step after baby step, one false doctrine right after another into apostasy. That's what it is. And I, I mentioned no uh, individuals in Catholicism. There are many. There are many sincere people in Catholicism and in denominationalism. This is why we preach these things, so that they can know the truth and that they can see the light. There was one solution. There's one solution for apostasy. What was the, what was the problem? What was apostasy? What brought apostasy about as we studied and as we saw? It was a departure from the scriptures. It was a departure from the word of God. Because Paul said they depart from the faith. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God, Romans 10. So it was a departure from God's word. A departure from that which is theotmistos, God breathed, to that which is man breathed. So what's the solution? Well, Paul gave the solutions. You know, when he was talking to the Ephesian elders, and he talked about grievous wolves coming into the flock and not sparing it and, and leadership rising up and leading away disciples after themselves and then saying that he talked about it for three years and that he wept over it he said but I commend you to God and his word to the word of his grace you see that's the solution that has always been the answer is to adhere to God's words. Don't make exceptions for emergency situations when there is no authority. Go by the scriptures. Nadab and Abihu were mentioned earlier. They didn't act on faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We've got to stick with the word of God. <clears throat> so in closing, just let me say, thanks to God that we have the words of His grace that many, many here tonight, and many throughout the world have searched sincerely for the truth and the true pattern and true Christianity and the true faith and have found it. And thanks be to God that we have His Word, that there are many in denominationalism now and Catholicism who are sincerely seeking it, have not yet found it, but can. That's why we preach. That's why we will go out and preach for their souls that they may be saved. And thanks be to God that we have His Word still to this day, that true faith, the true church, can still exist, and still does exist today.